and welcome to Nautilus TV, the channel for maritime professionals. And welcome back to our second episode. It's nice to have you with us. If this is the first time that you're coming to our show, do make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes and give us a like. Please do share us with friends. On today's show, you can find loads of information about how Nautilus is supporting our members working at sea and ashore. Plus, the Nautilus team is here to discuss the significance of the NATO summit in Washington, what the recent UK elections mean for workers' rights here in the UK, and an update on industrial action by our members working with the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. So if you like what you see, please do subscribe to the show, give us a like and share with friends and colleagues. But first, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. I'm going to give you this flag. Can you just have a look at it and try and tell me what flag that is? I've got no idea. I'd say maybe one of the Channel Islands, Guernsey or something. Oh mate, I've got no idea. <laughs> Can you name three famous seafarers? Oh God. Colombo? Chris, no? Uh, Christopher Columbus, Francis Drake. Um, Do you know where your nearest port is? I would take a chance and say somewhere around North Shields. I would argue time lapse, I think. Um... Welcome back. With me now is Danny McGowan, Head of International Relations at Nautilus International. Hi, Danny. Hi, Helen. Hello. Danny, as we're recording uh, this episode, world leaders are meeting in Washington, D.C. for the NATO summit. Nautilus and 10 other maritime unions have urged NATO members attending the meeting to confront the alarming decline in the numbers of qualified merchant seafarers and national flagged vessels. Why is this important and what are we asking NATO members to do about it? This, this summit will focus on defence and mostly on military spending and, and military operations uh, in the world. But actually, in support of military operations, merchant navies are very important. Uh, and that can be both for, for defence operations, it can be for national security, or even for, for such, such events as bringing in, in food uh, and other, other commerce. And, and, and as we know, 95% of, of what comes into the UK comes by ship. So it's important to recognise that, that whilst defence and whilst military spending is very important, that the merchant navies need investment. And, and having seen a, ma a massive decline uh, over the past 50 years, let's say, certainly in, in Europe, now is a good time that we can start to reinvest in these merchant navies, uh, reinvest in, in national seafarers, and importantly, in national flag shipping as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we've also raised the problem of flags of convenience, um, insofar as the risks that they have posed for national merchant navies. What risks do they pose, and what are trade unions asking NATO to do about it? Shipping companies will register their vessels to a flag of convenience, often for lower regulation, perhaps for lower tax, uh, and that's why we call them convenient, flags of convenience. It's convenient for a shipping company to do that. But in having that system in maritime, national flags are finding themselves having to compete, and national flags will often have higher standards and, and, and perhaps higher fees, but that's because of the, the higher standards that they have. It's, it's a naturally joined thing to say that the, the, the charges will be higher because of higher regulation. Uh, that's, that's a fact. But it's really important for countries like the United Kingdom, like the Netherlands, to have a, a national flag and a healthy national flag so that we can call on those vessels to assist us in, in times of defence, uh, to call on those vessels to assist uh, the country when we need to bring more goods into the country for, for whatever reason that might be, whether that's a health-related reason, whether that's a, a defence or even a, a war-related situation, then it's really important that we have that ability to, to do that. Through the statement that the unions have, have crafted, and, and it's quite difficult to, to get a, such a statement like this agreed on such a, an important occasion, but through this statement, we're asking for NATO member states and the governments of, of those NATO member states to invest in a merchant navy, to invest in domestic seafarers, 
and to be able to make our environment more secure. Mm. Uh, and we shouldn't wait to do that. That's something we should do now. No, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for that, Danny. Earlier, I spoke with uh, Nautilus General Secretary Mark Dickinson about why we're calling on NATO Alliance and its member states to invest in the Merchant Navy. Let's take a look at that interview now. Hello, Mark. Good to see you. Hi, Helen. Mark, we are recording this episode today on Thursday the 11th of July and as we speak, world leaders are meeting in Washington for a NATO summit yeah. where it's widely expected they'll talk about you know, um, geopolitical risks such as a war in Ukraine, threats posed by China and other concerns of global security. Given the rise in geopolitical tensions and the critical role of merchant navies in national security, how do you propose NATO members can effectively balance military investments with the necessary funding for merchant navy revitalization? Well, I mean, I don't think they are. Mm. So that's the, the first point I'd like to make about that particular point is that uh, NATO's mission is compromised and frustrated by the lack of uh, mercantile marine and maritime professionals. So. You know, that's something we are very, very agitated about and concerned about. And given this momentous occasion, the 75th anniversary of NATO, uh, and recognising how crucial that's been to sustain peace in Europe and in the North Atlantic, of course, um, we've been calling on NATO to, to, to reflect on that and to think about the necessity to support the growth of the mercantile marines in NATO countries. And we've signed and issued a statement supported by 11 Nautilus Federation affiliates in NATO countries calling for that. that. There needs to be a coalition of NATO member governments to support national uh, mercantile marines and national maritime professionals because we're too over-reliant on flags of convenience. They're the dominant force in shipping and you know the top three are Liberia, Panama and Marshall Islands. And I don't want to be too dismissive of them, uh, and I respect their, uh, you know, their sovereign rights, but they're not much use to you in a war. Uh, last time I checked, there is no uh, Panamanian Navy, there is no Liberian Navy, and there is no Marshall Islands Navy. And it is a bit grotesque. Um, when I think back to the day of the seafarer that we've just mm. celebrated last month, yes. Um, which we seem to be, well, the, the focus was personal safety. Uh, and, That's right. You know, seafarers have a role, obviously, to, to play in that. Yep. And I don't want to diminish that in any way, because that's really important. But right now, it seems like we're focusing on the wrong issue. We've got uh, Houthi rebels. They've attacked 60 ships in the last 12 months. Uh, we've had seafarers killed. Mm. Um, they're putting their lives at risk. And the ship owners call on the navies of the United States, the UK and other European nations to defend them. Meanwhile, they choose the flags of Liberia, Panama, Marshlands and other flags of convenience and expect everybody else to come rushing to their defence when there's a problem. And that's bizarre. Mm, it's a I don't disconnect. Know how, it's a disconnect. Yeah. The, the industry's fragmented and the ship owners don't seem to understand that when they make that choice, to use a flag of convenience and to walk away from their, their, their home flags, if I may describe it like that, the mm. flags of the beneficial owners or where the control lies. I mean, but, but let's, let's recall that under international law, the flag state is obliged to ensure that there's a genuine link between the flag and the owner of the vessel so that they can exercise effective control over that vessel. Mm. And the flag state has a responsibility to protect that vessel and to protect, most importantly, the crew. So whilst the IMO is saying, what personal tips have you got for your safety? Mm. The backdrop is the flag states pay little or no attention to providing that fundamental obligation that they have to our people, maritime professionals. When I think about Nautilus International members, but I also think about the Nautilus Federation family the ITF family of unions, the 1.8 million seafarers out there risking their lives, as they did during COVID. And I think right now, as we have these heightened um, tensions in the Middle East, war in Europe and Ukraine, we've got the rising threat of 
Russia and China and now North Korea. Uh, the, the world is very, very, very uncertain at the moment. And right now we need NATO and we need NATO members to think about the mercantile, marine and maritime professionals dimension because they cannot deliver their mission without us and we need investment. It doesn't matter whether you think about the United States, if you think everything's fine in the United States, it's not. Mm. They have the same recruitment and retention crisis in the States that we have globally and we have particularly in the UK and it needs to be addressed because it undermines our resilience and our security. Without maritime, there is no resilience and there is no security. COVID showed us that most recently. Mm. But now we have these tensions in the world and they're, they're, the, all the generals and the admirals are saying it's going to get worse. They're even talking about the, on the news this morning, the possibility of another world war, a third mm. world war. Mm. Imagine mm. that. I mean, it's a horrific thought. It's awful. But it's right to talk about it, it's right to think about it and strategize and plan to avoid it. Mm. But you can't avoid it. You can't strategize and plan without the mercantile marine. Mm. So where are we? They need to talk to us. They need to demonstrably invest in the mercantile marine, national flag shipping, mm. not rely on flags of convenience, and national maritime professionals. And that's the critical thing that's missing in this conversation right now as we celebrate, or as they celebrate in Washington, D.C., the 75th anniversary of NATO. Welcome back. With me now is Robert Murta, Communications Campaigns Organiser at Nautilus International. Hi, Robert. Hello, Helen. Hi. So, Robert, the big story here in the UK is obviously the new Labour government that has formed following the landslide victory in the recent general election. It's been a busy few days for the new government, which has formed its government and appointed most, if not all, of its MPs. How has that shaped up for the transport and the maritime team? Yes, um, so absolutely, landslide victory uh, for Labour in the general election. Um, I think it's quite interesting. One of the things that Labour and Keir Starmer had said throughout the election campaign and sort of the, the undercurrent of their campaign was this idea of stability, mm -hmm. right? That's what they wanted to restore to politics. That was their promise. And I think what we've seen from the appointments that they've made is that stability. And if we look at the transport team in particular, you know, we're looking at the Secretary of State for Transport Transport, who is Louise Haig. She was the Shadow Secretary of State. She remains, as uh, she stayed in that post now, as I say, Secretary of State. Uh, and of course, for us, the key person is the new Maritime Minister. Um, and the Shadow Maritime Minister was Mike Cain, and he has kept that portfolio in government. This is somebody we formed a good relationship with. Um, he came to Mariners Park, our home uh, on the banks of the Mersey, back in February in his shadow role. Um, he saw the great work that we do. Um, we managed to to talk to him a bit about some of the priorities we would like to see from a Labour government. So we're really pleased to see that, that Mike Cain is back uh, in that role and someone that, as I say, we have a relationship with and of course we will continue uh, to develop that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And he's also somebody who knows Maritime from mm -hmm. the inside. He's a yep. former seafarer himself. He used to work for the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, which I know we're going to speak about a bit later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, really pleased to see that that team is... Uh, has that stability exactly. and is shaping up in the way that it has. But we have also been very busy mm -hmm. engaging with the transport team to reiterate our calls for uh, a mandatory seafarers charter, yep. among other things. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of those key asks for the new government? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, as I mentioned, we have a good relationship uh, with Mike Cain, but, but fundamentally this is about delivery for our members and delivery on the priorities that we've set out. And I think, you know, I've got the manifesto in front of us here, turning yeah. the tide and mission to revitalise our nation's maritime sector. So for anyone watching, I would encourage them to, to read the manifesto. But this manifesto really does lay out our key priorities uh, for the next government. And if we start from the point of view, and this is where the manifesto starts, that we are at historic lows in the number of UK resident seafarers, qualified seafarers, and the number of UK registered vessels. And this is really, that, that decline is what we're asking the 
next government to really tackle, to change, to reverse that decline. And we set out in the manifesto, we sort of have four key areas around skills and training, around employment protections, around growing our domestic industry, and of course, leadership on the international uh, level. So uh, as you mentioned, Helen, one of the things that Labour committed to on the back of the P&O ferry scandal was a mandatory seafarers charter. The previous government brought in a voluntary charter. We said it wasn't enough. It needed to go further. It needed to be mandatory. We also criticised the contents of the charter. In many respects, it didn't go further than what it's already codified in the Maritime Labour Convention. So Labour have committed to this charter. I think now it's about delivering. Uh, it's about working with Labour, how we can get it delivered, how we can get it implemented. And fundamentally, then, how can we uh, make sure that these sort of exploitative crewing practices that the likes of p Ferries are using, that they are done away with effectively. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So outside of the transport team, we've also had a first meeting with Armed Forces Minister Luke Pollard about the industrial action that our members are taking at the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. What was the sense of that meeting? Do you get the feeling that Labour is aware of the ongoing dispute and has a plan for resolving it? Yes, um, absolutely. So first of all, I think, um, you know, Luke Pollard, who is the Minister for Armed Forces, uh, was appointed and the following day we had a meeting um, alongside our colleagues in the RMT who are also uh, in dispute at, at the RFA. So I think this is a real statement of intent from the government. It wasn't negotiations, um, it was an initial meeting, um, but it was a positive meeting. Um, they actually tweeted, I'll read out the tweet, um, so this is from the Ministry of Defence, um, who said after the meeting with a, a photograph of Mark Dickinson, our General Secretary, and Mick Lynch, the General Secretary of the RMT, and they they said the men and women serving in the Royal Fleet Auxiliary are integral to defence's operations uh, around the world. And as I say, posted that photograph with our General Secretary and with the General Secretary of the RMT. So I think it's, it's, it's a positive sounding. It's about relationship building. Fundamentally, of course, it'll come down to negotiations. And our members at the RFA, they have had 14 years of pay cuts. They've had a real terms pay cut of over 30%. Um, and I think, you know, fundamentally, it's about can they deliver what our members want? And can we get, get that pay restoration and get a decent pay rise for our members who are vital to, to the UK's maritime uh, capabilities? So I think it's, it's a positive step in the right direction. Engagement is always really, really important. Yeah. But engagement is about delivery. And let's see what the delivery is. Yeah, absolutely. There's some very positive first signs there. Yeah. Really pleased to get that early engagement. You know, so soon into the new Labour government, but let's wait and see exactly. And what exactly is delivered. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Robert. So as Robert has described, years of austerity have created a recruitment and retention crisis at the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. But a different set of policies have led to the same dire situation at the United States Military Sea Lift Command. Our colleague, Rob Coston, spoke with Sal Mercoglianu, a former MSC seafarer who explains the situation. And we ask whether, in an increasingly unsafe world, Western nations can afford to keep neglecting these vital seafarers. All right, so our members will be familiar with the situation at the RFA where there has been a, an ongoing pay issue that's led to a, a serious recruitment and retention crisis. Now, my understanding from a couple of your videos before is that there's a similar recruitment and retention problem for military sea lift command, but that has some quite different origins. So yeah, can you tell us a bit about that? What's going on there? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, the members of RFA would find the, the problem very different than what they have in MSC. So for example, pay is not the issue. If you look at the salaries being offered, by Military Sealift Command, uh, RFA would love the money. Uh, it, it looks great. I mean, we're, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars in the, in the U.S., I mean, for starting jobs. And so uh, literally uh, the Navy, the U.S. Navy, has been throwing m money at the problem. The issue has been really the leave policy. Uh, as civilian mariners, they operate under the same leave system that federal employees in the U.S. government operate. So if you're working in Washington, D.C., in the Beltway, you basically have the same leave system as someone who's sailing at sea. And I think, uh, you know, people who sail on the RFA will understand that a job at sea is not a job at land. You don't go home every night. Uh, it, it's not nine to five, Monday through Friday with, with your holidays off. And, and, you know, you can schedule your days off and holidays so that you can, you know, make a life of it. For MSC, it's been a systematic problem. 
for a new mariner on board, whether a, uh, a deck officer, a mate, or an engineer, they would have to work almost 10 months of the year to get their full leave in. So they would have to be on board for quite a long period of time. And then their leave is very short, very quick, and their policy for getting back on and off the ships has been a problem. So MSC is guaranteed uh, basically a four-month sea tour. You show up on your ship, supposed to be on four months, and then they guarantee you two months off. The problem is those guarantees don't work. Uh, no one's getting off in four months. And the two months you have off, a lot of that is unpaid during that period of time because you don't have enough leave. Uh, and then even when you get off, you're kind of badgered and harassed to get back onto a ship or else you may lose your spot because they need people. The The way it, it basically falls out for Military Sea Lift Command is they have an, a, a workforce of about 6,000 mariners to fill 5,000 spots. So that means there's 1.2 people for every spot. And, and, it, and it's just an unsustainable number. You would need, in, in my argument, about 10,000 mariners. You need about 4,000 more. You almost need one for one. If for every person you're sailing, you need somebody to at least be coming on. Maybe you can get by with 1.75, 1.8. But this this has been a, a, a detrimental problem. What has happened in Military Sea Lift Command is ships are being gapped. Some ships are take, being taken out of service for lack of crews. Uh, ships are not being able to perform their mission to their full capability. So, for example, if you're an underway replenishment vessel, you may not have enough crews to fly all the rigs you need to do a uh, replenishment at sea. And this has a big issue should all of a sudden there, there be a, a, a conflict or an emergency. We may not have the requisite mariners to fill out the entire fleet. And more importantly, should there be losses or, or uh, issues, uh, many mariners will just simply walk away and go get jobs somewhere else for comparable money and much better leave. I mean, even before there's, um, you know, some kind of catastrophic conflict in the global situation we have now, obviously there are, are deployments around the world um, with a ratio like that of personnel to births on board. That must be having a really serious effect on on. It the does. Personnel. I mean, what, one of the things we're seeing is a big turnover, and so you know, especially in the lower ranks, where in the unlicensed and the junior officer level, you're you're just kind of the, the term they use is churning. You're churning through a lot of people, mm -hmm. and th this is creates a big problem because if you can't retain them at that junior level, you're not able to train them up to be the mid level and the upper level. And that has created a problem in that MSE has had to bring a lot of people in at a much higher level than they normally do, which means you've got to educate them on it. Uh, I, you know, RFA personnel will, will will tell you, and same as MSC, it's not the same seafaring job as running a tanker from point A to point B or a container ship. Very different jobs, uh, very dynamic jobs, and require an understanding of the situations, especially when you're sailing right alongside a vessel at 150 feet at 12, 13 knots, and you're trying to pump high, you know, you know, very volatile uh, diesel fuel and jet fuel over to them. And so th this has been an issue, but the problem is very similar to the RFA is this is very low on the pecking order of the U.S. military. Uh, military Seal of Command is not well represented in the military, in my opinion. They're commanded by a two-star admiral. Back in the day when they were first created, it was a three-star. Back when a three-star admiral was rare, uh, now you 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 know can't hit any admiral in the Pentagon without hitting a three star, uh, and and it really doesn't get the the say. Now they're trying to reform this, they're trying to improve this, and 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 get more leave uh, for them. It's just been ridiculously slow. I, I you know one of the reasons I left MSC and I sailed with them you know back in the nineties was because of the leave policy. It was just it was it was really bad. It was eleven months on my first ship until I got relieved. And uh, it hasn't gotten much better, unfortunately. For captains navigating the busy shipping lanes of Northern Europe, ensuring the safety of their crew and their ships is absolutely vital. But according to one pilot, an invisible threat has been lurking under the waves for years. Fake deep sea pilots are putting seafarers' lives at risk. Captain Henk Eichenar has been a licensed deep sea pilot for four years, guiding massive cargo ships, tankers and car carriers in these waters. As one of the few voices raising the alarm on this issue, he paints a concerning picture of a broken system that nobody wants to acknowledge. 
I spoke with Captain Eichenar about the risks these face pilots pose and what can be done about it. Hello, today I'm with Captain Henk Eichenar, pilot and CHIRP ambassador who is raising awareness of fake deep sea pilots in European waters. Hi Henk, how are you? Very good, thank you. How are you, Alan? Yeah, really good, thank you. Really nice to speak to you and good to be raising awareness of this issue. Can you explain for us first what exactly is a fake deep sea pilot and why should we be worried about it? Yeah, well, uh, to become a deep sea pilot, uh, you need a minimum of experience, which is uh, laid down by law, uh, international law between uh, Holland, UK and uh, Belgium, France, uh, and Denmark and Germany, mm -hmm. and uh, you have an education of about six months to become a deep sea pilot, uh, which gives you a uh, deep knowledge of the North Sea, okay. yeah, the area where we're sailing in, and we get uh, a deep knowledge of the coal wrecks, the collision regulations, we get a special course for that. So you learn a lot more than normally you would know as a ship's master. Now, uh, uh, the deep sea Fake pilots, they will not call themselves mostly pilots. They call themselves nautical advisors, but they sell themselves as a pilot. Okay. They, they could be even, for example, a third officer. Yeah, they don't, there is no control on them. Also, they don't have the deep knowledge as we have as a deep sea pilot. So when they come on board and a captain does not know that he has a fake pilot on board, he will put his trust into him, yeah, mm. give him over the navigation of the ship, mm -hmm. yeah, because the master will always keep the responsibility, but he will give the navigation of the ship in the hands of somebody who is not adept for it. And yeah, that means a lot of risks for uh, the captain and uh, the ship owner, but especially the captain as he is still respons responsible for the ship and the crew. Right. So these are people who haven't had the full training they don't have the deep knowledge or perhaps the understanding of the waters that they are sailing in and yet they are being given effective control of the vessel under the captain's um you know responsibility for yeah. guiding that ship um yeah. you know in these particular waters how is it that they are able to you know sell these services without the proper training uh, well, unfortunately, there are some uh, crewing, uh, piloted crewing, because the difference between a deep sea pilot and a normal port pilot is that port pilot are state control of control by the port. Okay. So there is a control on it. Deep sea pilot not. They are uh, employed by private uh, associations. Okay. And some of them, unfortunately, employ also unlicensed pilots. Yes. Because there, there is a shortage and right. more and more demand of it. And that's how they get onto the ships. There are also some private, because everybody can sell himself as a so-called North Sea pilot, as right. there is no control on it. Right. So when you say there's no control on it, do you mean that there's no international regulation that oversees the services of uh, deep sea pilotage? No, there is. We okay. are underneath an IMO regulation, IMO yes. 1080. So that is very, very good regulated international, only yes. there is no control on it. Right. Nobody's so checking it. There's no enforcement mechanism. No. no. Right. Okay. So would you be advocating for an improved or just full stop and enforcement? Um, Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I think that's, uh, yeah, that could be port state control if they check the ships inside the port when there is a Nazi pilot on board or a so-called nautical advisor, they should ask for his license and, and check it because they check the whole crew. Mm. But I've been on board several times when Port State was on board and nobody ever asked for my license. Nobody. Nautilus senior journalist Sarah Robinson joins me now. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Hello. So you've been looking into job opportunities in the offshore renewable sector. Can you describe for us the significance of this growing sector for our members? Well, anybody who saw our video magazine last month would have seen Nautilus General Secretary Mark Dickinson talking about the importance of offshore renewables to the just transition. And the point is that as offshore oil and gas is phased out, we don't want to leave any members behind who are currently working in that sector. 
we want them to have good new jobs in offshore renewables, which is basically wind farms, but also can mean things like floating wind platforms. And also there are proposals for things like uh, creating green hydrogen through using offshore wind turbines and the whole thing works offshore. So we've been doing this body of work to investigate this growing sector and we've looked at all sorts of things, really looked at government policies, how governments have been investing in offshore renewables and we were looking at jobs in the sector and also at union activity. Great. So I know that our team and you in particular have been doing a lot of work around uh, the renewable sector. Can you explain a little bit more for me, please? OK, uh, so one thing which we did was very valuable is that I interviewed a couple of our Nautilus colleagues who are experts in that sector to find out what jobs they're seeing coming through and what the um, union activity is in the sector. So I spoke to Martin Gray, who's our director of organising in the UK branch, and also to Michelle Steckete, who is senior national secretary in the Netherlands branch. And that was particularly interesting, I thought, uh, talking to Michelle, because the offshore renewable sector is a little bit different in the Netherlands from what it is in the UK. Um, and they're finding that um, companies who are already doing other work in the North Sea are thinking about repurposing their vessels. So perhaps from dredging to offshore renewables, crew transport, and also uh, taking materials out to build the um, wind turbines. That sounds really interesting, Sarah, and it sounds like there really are a lot of good job opportunities for our members in this emerging and growing sector. Now, I know that you have done an interview with our colleague, Michelle, and we've got a clip of that. We're going to go over to that now. So, Michelle, what kind of jobs are there for Nautilus members in offshore renewables? There's the construction vessels, uh, there's the multi-purpose supply vessels, there's the, the crew transfer and the supply vessels, and the use of them are uh, dependable on the, on, the, on, the, on the stages of development of the, of the wind farms. Could be uh, uh, the construction uh, period, or the operating and maintenance period, or the decommissioning period. What kind of sectors are people coming from when they switch to working in these new jobs in offshore renewables? Well, in, in the Netherlands, we, we've got uh, uh, four, the big four, we call them, in the dredging sector, four big companies. And uh, all those four companies are also operating now in the, in the offshore wind. Um, but we also see that, that op, uh, companies operating before in the oil and gas, or still operating in oil and gas, they also made this, make the switch to the, to the offshore wind. And there's, uh, of course, also new personnel coming in. They're, they're leaving school and they, they don't go to dredging or to oil and gas. They just start uh, immediately at the offshore wind. Why should seafarers in offshore renewables join Nautilus? Well, at first, every seafarer should uh, uh, join Nautilus. We, we stand for uh, securing decent wages and, and working conditions. Also in the offshore wind, that's, that's uh, something we work on. So are, are we looking to negotiate new CBAs or collective bargaining agreements in the sector? Well, in, in the Netherlands, we, 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 had, uh, we, we tried to accomplish uh, a national sector uh, CBA for the offshore wind, but, but it was very difficult because the employers don't have an employers association for the offshore wind. Uh, they don't see us as, as a, a counter partner in, the, in this. And uh, so we, we changed our strategy a little bit from uh, a gaining a, a, a national CBA to gaining CBAs on uh, companies. Some companies where we already have got dredging agreements, uh, we want to uh, uh, broaden those agreements also to the wind offshore uh, personnel. Sarah, you've also been speaking with a former radio officer, Fazal Khan, who is the founder of the Green Seas Trust, a campaigning maritime charity best known for its Bin for Green Seas project. Can you tell us a little bit more? 
I'll fascinate somebody who I've known for quite a while now, and um, she was actually a Nautilus member right back in the day when it was the REOU, which is the Radio and Electronic Officers Union. So that's going back quite a while before the Newmast merger and then on to Nautilus. Um, in that time, Fazalette found herself uh, without a job because radio officers were phased out and she started to get into environmental work and she founded the Green Seas Trust charity and the reason that I was speaking to her on this occasion is that I'd just been to the opening of a new bin for Green Seas, um, which hopefully you can see on screen now. That's, yeah. Um, Perhaps I'll stop saying that. Oh, no, sorry, that, <laughs> Jamie, that was for you. That's to sort of show that when I say that, perhaps you can bring the slide up. Yeah, so, yeah. So, okay. Um, all right. The bin for Green Seas is at once a practical bin, which you put plastic waste in to stop it reaching the sea, and also a campaigning tool. So it's got this great big eye-catching design and information about maritime pollution on it and that kind of thing. Um, and the new one is right outside the International Maritime Organization uh, on the River Thames in central London. And um, Fazalet managed to get the Secretary General of the IMO, Arsenio Dominguez, <laughs> to open it for her. So that was great. We had a lovely opening and, um, and then I invited Fazalet back to our office afterwards to tell me a bit about how she started the Green Seas Trust charity. When I first uh, went to sea, um, bottled water was unheard of. And, uh, you know, it was um, the pristine places that I visited was just, you know, it was just God's, God's own countries, I would say. Unfortunately, the uh, convenience of having uh, drinks on the go and bottled water took over and the demand created I saw this exponential increase in littering. And so these beautiful places that I had gone to when I first started my career became more and more covered with uh, plastic pollution. And when did you decide to take that forward by founding your own environmental charity? So um, when my mother passed away, I went to Tobago, which is where she came from. And uh, I just wanted to sort of see the island and, and you know, connect with my roots. Um, but then I saw that a lot of people were, um, would go to the beach and then they would leave all their you know, their uh, plastic rubbish and food, you know, food containers, etc. leave it on the beach or actually throw it into the sea. Um, and I, and I thought this was, uh, this wasn't right. But because I was on holiday, I didn't really think too much about it. And, uh, you know, got back to the UK. And I, and I was telling my father about it. And he said, um, you know, you're a sensible person, you'll come up with a solution. And the next day got made redundant. So I took this upon myself as a, as a sign in neon lights to go back and do something. And so I set up Green Seas Trust in memory of my mother. And I did go back to uh, Tobago. And I watched people. And one of the um, uh, underlying problems was that there were actually no bins on any of the beaches. So I got a company to donate oil drums, which we had painted and put on all the beaches. And would you believe it, within three weeks, the problem did go away. It was just amazing to see the contrast between having the bins there and when it wasn't there. Nautilus has launched our sea service record, a fully digital platform for sea time verification that has been approved by the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. Nautilus sea service record is available to all members working in the super yacht industry. And here we can play a short video about this revolutionary new service.
Nautilus recently published the history of our maritime trade union. It was written by former Telegraph editor Andrew Linnington. And last year at our general meeting in October, we did a fabulous interview with him and heard all the insights about the founding of our wonderful union. You can hear from him now. The book really begins in the sort of early 1700s where seafarers were starting to really agitate for better conditions. Um, there are so many themes which are still relevant to the present day of too many people chasing too few jobs, uh, wages being suppressed and all the rest of it. And then obviously the struggles to combine because the, uh, there were anti-union laws in place at the time. Um, so that real... Um, challenge of how people could work together, for, certainly in a way that was illegal for many, many years, um, and the tradition of self-help among seafarers, which goes back actually to the Middle Ages of seafarers clubbing together literally to, to, to provide pensions and uh, a for early form of insurance. And so you see all those old traditions building through into the sort of birth of the union in the 1850s and get them carrying on forward. I think particularly the relevance for the current day and, and where you see some amazing parallels with today is obviously the, all the debates about automation, um, which were there in the 1950s and early 60s when ships started to sort of bring in um, uh, automated engine rooms for instance and, and massive debate and there's some lovely quotes in there from kind of quite prophetic um, general secretaries at the time. I would say this book is for anyone who's interested in shipping and seafaring. It charts as we all know this amazing history of our, our union from the 1850s uh, into the present day and even looking ahead and that whole sense of seafarers sticking together, working together, uh, hence the title. Um, and with the collective voice to redress so many grievances. One of the things that really struck me in my research was sort of finding our links with our Dutch colleagues, you know, going right back to the 1830s, sorry, not eight, 1930s, um, where, you know, the uh, immense solidarity, where, you know, we were supporting them in that major, major strike against um, cuts in their pay and conditions. And uh, so you kind of, see, it's been a privilege to see all of those sort of things coalescing and germinating and, and bubbling up to, to what we have today. I've worked for the union for well over 30 years and uh, I think we're all familiar with the sort of, um, the, the, possibly the sort of cynical non-member who says, yeah, what's the union ever done for us? And there's an appendix in the book that I, if, if you don't read anything else, read this appendix because it's five pages of more than a hundred achievements that Nautilus and all its predecessors have made um, o over those years. And, uh, and I think that will tell you, you know, why, why the union's important and why you need to reflect on how things would be very, very different if, if Nautilus and all its predecessors hadn't existed. Well, that's it for today, folks. Thank you very much for joining us again on Nautilus TV. If you have any friends or colleagues who you think could benefit from this program, please do share it with them. Give us a like and also uh, hit the subscribe button. And don't forget, if you're not in membership, you are not covered. Nautilus International represents maritime workers both at sea and ashore. So if you're interested, do look in the show notes. I'll put a link to our joining pages. Um, and we'd love to see you in membership. Thank you and goodbye. See you next time.